when, when lockdown started, I lost over 15 hours of face-to-face -face time with people in my work. Uh, some of that was caught up on Zoom, but, but actually my life got slower. I, we know this, right? A lot of us had a lot more time and just a slower pace of life. And equally now, as things open up, things are getting fast, aren't they? And I wonder if some of you even this afternoon on Zoom are feeling the quicker pace, or maybe it's going to start tomorrow for you, and the tiredness that comes with that. It takes a fair bit of focus and energy to get back into it and to spread yourself out a bit more. Um, but not just um, a change of pace is going on in this season, but maybe even a change of direction. Uh, we've heard about in America, the great resignation, huge rates of people resigning and wanting a change for their life, maybe a change for their career or their lifestyle. Um, I know lots of people who through the very the two lockdowns have decided to move to Barrel or to move to Byron Bay. Um, and I'm surprised there's anybody left in Bondi, but as per usual, there is. No, but, but people are deciding to go maybe rural or, or at least regional. Um, there's a lot of not just change of pace, but maybe a change of direction and jobs and location, these kinds of things. Uh, and I'm so glad, uh, this is true all the time, that God is our shepherd. You see it in Jesus. And tonight he's going to shepherd us through this season by providing something of a compass for us, by providing for us a reminder of true north in this changing season. You might feel unsettled. Uh, I do. Uh, you might feel tired. I can tell you after even just planning to do some opening, I'm feeling a little tired, but God is our shepherd and he's going to provide for you here a, a, a north once more, just in case we've forgotten, just in case we needed it um, to, to reorient us for this new season. So I want to invite you now to do that very basic thing of placing your faith in Jesus, that he's going to be your shepherd, even now in this, because what we have here in Romans chapter 13 is a call to the Christian vocation, to that basic Christian life of love. God calls you tonight back to that thing that we do that's based for us, love. Listen to verse 8. It says, let no debt remain outstanding. He's just been talking about other debts in the last few sentences. He said, make sure you pay your taxes. Don't have debts of taxes to the government. And he also says, make sure that you pay honour where honour is due to the authorities. There's a certain way that we treat the police, uh, that, that we treat the other authorities in our lives. So he says, pay your taxes, pay honour to the authorities. And now he says, actually, don't have any debts. Well, not that don't have any debts, but don't have any debts outstanding. We should always, we might have a mortgage or, or, or maybe a loan, but we should always have a plan to have that paid off. We don't just have debts outstanding against us. It's not a good way of life. God tells us here in Romans chapter 13. Okay, so he says, verse eight, let no debt remain outstanding except one. There's one debt that it remains over your head and my head. head. And that we don't have a plan to ever have this one paid off. Listen, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. In the same way that a mortgage is attached to you and you might try and run away from you, but it'll chase you. We have a, we have a calling on our lives, but it's not, a, it's not, it's not like a mortgage that's bad news. Uh, in some ways, um, uh, we have a debt to love one another. And it, it just follows us around. It's just our thing. It's our obligation is to love one another. And I want to show you here in Romans chapter 13, when are we to love other people? Who are we to love? Why are we to love? And how are we to love? That's what's God going to show you here. And uh, as I say, it's kind of like a compass for the new season for opening up. He's going to show you those four things. So first of all, when are we to love? Well, you've probably already got the idea all the time. This is a debt that belongs to us. Uh, this is something that we, we won't shake. This is, our, this is direction for you tomorrow on Monday. This is guidance from God for you for next week and for 2022. Actually, this is God's call on your life for your whole life. When are we to love? All the time. We are to have lives that just give to other people. That's what love is. Love is not... Um, a fuzzy feeling, although sometimes it is a warm feeling. Love is when we give of ourselves. Now, you make sure that as we go through this little passage about love, that you continually have um, a definition of love that comes from God that is pouring himself out even into death. That's what love is, pouring himself out for your sake. And when are we to love? We're to love at all times. 
And I want to keep this really practical as we go. This is not abstract. This is not ethereal. Let's, let's stay um, real practical um, and think about the big and the small areas of our life. Um, when are we to love? We're to love in the big decisions of our life. When we're deciding maybe to resign and do something different, one of the factors that should be in our mind is not just what's going to benefit me, but what's going to be of benefit to other people. Will this life decision, maybe a resignation or maybe a career change, um, and I'm not just talking about now, I'm talking about at all times, when we're deciding where to live, when we're deciding family questions, um, it's, part of our, our deal is, will this increase my love for other people? Will I be able to benefit more people by doing this? So I want to encourage you to think of, think of loving in the big parts of your life, but also in the small parts of your life. Just as you go through your day, you'll, you'll come across people, love them. They won't be planned. They won't be part of your big five-year plan on paper or your 10-year plan on paper. They'll just be whoever turns up and we're to love whoever God puts in our way. Um, I, I want you to think about work for a bit. So much of our work is geared towards, it's literally geared towards profit or geared towards efficiency so that we can have profit. But for us as Christians, our work will be marked by love. And as much as in our capacity, you might not be a top tier level leader. So as much as in your capacity, you should make the motivation of your work love. And so as you punch out spreadsheets for someone, think of the someone and, and do it well for their sake. Not for profit for your company, not for profit for you particularly, not for the glory of your bosses or your team, but think how can I do this in a way that is gonna bless the other people on the, end of, the other end of the spreadsheet. As you serve food, as you make a contract for people, it's not about what your boss wants particularly, although we, do, we are to honor our, uh, the people in authority over us, but we're to gear our work in making it good for the people we're trying to serve. And so if you're kind of, you know, maybe not a top tier level leader that gets to shape the industry, I want to say as much as in your capacity, have your motivation as love. And if you are blessed by God and put in authority, that's what Romans 13 said earlier, didn't it? That God puts people in authority. If God's put you in, in authority of a team or um, a whole company or, or maybe towards the top of an industry, then you, you ought to gear that industry towards benefiting people not just benefiting yourself or your shareholders. This is how love comes into our day-to-day. -day. So when are we to love? In all things, I'm saying the big things, big decisions, and then day-to-day, -day, even in how we make a spreadsheet or, or draw up a contract or draw the plans as an architect or serve the food or clean the toilet. We serve with love, not with selfishness. Okay, when are we to love? All times. Who are we to love? Who? Well, look at what the verse says. Verse 8 says, Verse eight says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, literally uh, in, the, in the original text there, it says, whoever loves the other. It's, it's quite enigmatic, isn't it? Whoever loves the other has fulfilled the law. So who are we to love? We're to love the other. And it reminds me of the Lord Jesus, how he says that story of the Good Samaritan. Remember, the, the lawyer, we've got a few lawyers on here, so I'll be careful what I say. But the, the lawyer tries to get Jesus to define, hang on, so who, who's my neighbor? Who do I need to love and who don't I need to love? Is it one house down the road or is it two houses or three houses that I need to love my neighbor? How many houses down the road, Jesus? And Jesus tells a story and flips it around and says, no, 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 no. You don't get to define who your neighbor is. You just be a good neighbor wherever you go. Remember the story about there's a man walking along the road? You know the story. Go and read it again if, you, if you've forgotten. But Jesus redefines good neighborliness and he says, you are to be a good neighbor wherever you go, however far down the road you get. So who are we to love? Whoever's in our path. Uh, you might have plans for tomorrow. I reckon God has plans to put people in your path, uh, maybe people who are not easy to love. And, and, and as we come across them, we just give of ourselves. We're to give to the other. That's who we love. Okay, so when do we love? All times. Let, let the debt remain to love others. Uh, who do we love? The other, whoever that is. Thirdly now, why are we to love? Well, 
I'll say more towards the end of the talk, but the passage gives us this profound understanding of the Old Testament. Listen, if you want to become an Old Testament scholar, um, um, Karen is a scholar who we just interviewed, is a scholar in archaeology. If you want to become an Old Testament scholar, look at this. Ready? Verse 8 um, says, For whoever loves the other has fulfilled the law. Now, the law is uh, the Old Testament law, but also it, it constitutes the five first books, uh, Genesis and, and the first five books there. And he's saying, if you want to understand those first five books of the law, the Jewish Torah, then what you need to do is love. And, and then you've understood the law. That's what God was saying. If you, if you want to know what it's saying, it's saying to love the other. He was trying to teach you. And now, now the reason we love is because um, that's what God intended for us. And listen, he's going to explain it. Verse 9. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment they may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. If you want to get the Old Testament done, if you want to understand the Old Testament, it's about loving our neighbor. And ultimately, that's because it's part of the fabric of our universe is to love. Because God who made the universe is love. That it's in his very nature and he's woven it into how the universe works. And I, I use the idea of a, a needle, uh, a compass before that God in this passage is giving us a compass about life. Well, you know how compasses work, right? It's a little piece of metal sitting on a water on, on some water, and it the needle actually lines up with our world, how our physical world is built, turns the magnetic forces of our of our earth, turn the little needle that's on the water. And so the needle is not just kind of um, um, magic. It actually lines up with the universe. It, it, it works because of how the universe is built. And love is the same. You will find that if you love, you will be going with the universe because our God is a God of love and it, life works on love. It runs on love. Why are we to love? It fulfills the law. It's what God was trying to tell us to do uh, and has shown us what to do in Jesus, who is the fulfillment of the law. This is why we love because it's what God has woven into the world and the law and, and the universe. Okay, now as I talk about love, you might be feeling the burden of, of this life of giving. And we ought to feel the burden of a life of love because Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, he said, if you want to follow me, if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself daily. You need to take up your cross daily. Jesus' understanding of death, uh, of love is a life of dying every day. And you will find that if you love people, it will mean death. You will miss out on hanging out with these people because you're loving this person. You will miss out on things because you spent all your money on someone else. You will miss out in all sorts of ways because you will have given what was yours to someone else. Love is a kind of death. I witnessed one of you, I can't explain very much, uh, um, I can't give you all the details, but this week I saw one of you loving someone else in our church. And uh, it was just plain hard work. I, I could see it. Uh, and actually, um, you called me and said, can you pray for me? This is going to be hard. And it was a kind of death. I, I know that sounds um, uh, overwrought, but it's, it's not. Because when you love other people, you're giving yourself up in big ways and small ways. And so I just really want to be realistic uh, as we look at this passage that is calling us to a life of love and, uh, and therefore a life of death. And I want to make sure you see this. Would you, would you please hold on to this? Ready? We find in the Gospels that, uh, well, we find here in Romans that loving, our love is a fulfillment of the law. But what we find in the Gospels, and I'm sure Paul has this in mind, is that Jesus says that he's the fulfillment of the law. And we've got to hold these things together. We can't just go off and live a life of love. I'll tell you why. Because the death of love or, or the constant dying that's in love will empty you. You'll be empty and you'll get 
um, just plain empty and kind of tired, or you'll get bitter. I'm so sick of giving to everybody else. No one ever gives to me. Or you'll get proud. Uh, this is the ugliest, isn't it? When, when people are so good at loving that all they want you to know is that, that they're very loving. Love will properly crush you if you do it without Jesus, without the true fulfillment of the law, who is Jesus. What you need is Jesus. Firstly, as an example, listen, Jesus died in love, like literally died in love, didn't he? He gave himself up and he was resurrected. And this will be the shape of your love, your, your dying love, as you love other people. If you do it in Jesus and with Jesus, it will be a death, but it will be a resurrection for you too. And he will give you life. You see, if you, um, if you, if you spend your life loving nothing or loving yourself, it's a life turned in on itself and actually it doesn't give you life. It's, it's paradoxical. It's as you pour out your life in love that you will be filled up. Um, and I said it's woven into the universe. Let me just remind you that the, uh, the psychologists tell us that when you do an act of kindness, it just gives you a little hit of oxytocin. And that's because loving other people is not only a death, it's life. God has made it this way that you will find life as you give yourself up. You, you, you get to the edge about to give yourself, you think, this is gonna, this is gonna take from me, and it will. But God will give to you, just like Jesus died and was resurrected. So, first of all, I want you to make sure you you, you see this. Uh, that that uh, we must do it with Jesus and it'll be a death and a resurrection. But secondly, uh, Jesus actually has given himself to fill you up. You, you want to ask, um, who's going to look after me if I'm looking after everybody else? Jesus says that he will look after you. How are we to love like this? Jesus says he'll look after you. He says that if you drink of him, he'll be like a spring of water. Can you, can you imagine it? Just think of yourself, your own body. Jesus says, if you drink from him, he will be like a spring of water that whirls up from inside of you and come, it overflows out of you. I want to call you to trust Jesus this afternoon, that as you give yourself to people who don't quite deserve it, who, people who are tiring maybe, um, give yourself up and have less for yourself, Jesus says he will fill you up. Place your faith in him and go out into Sunday night and into Monday and into your life with maybe big decisions or maybe just the small day-to-day -day decisions, giving of yourself, knowing that Jesus will look after you and provide for you. Press into him and go out as his people, full of love uh, and knowing his grace. Because as Romans chapter six says, we're not under law, but we're under grace. So feel the grace, enjoy the grace of Jesus. Let him fill you up and pour yourself out in love.